Hello, and welcome to the final video lecture in the regulation of mammalian fuel metabolism. Today, we are going to talk about obesity and insulin resistance. In the background of this slide, you will see a space filling model of the insulin receptor with insulin bound. During this lecture, you will learn a little bit more about the pathways of insulin signaling and how those can go haywire and lead to insulin resistance and downstream diabetes. As the map on the bottom right shows us, obesity has become an epidemic. Obesity is a combination of factors, both genetic and environmental, and it can be considered a dysregulation in the balance of energy intake, storage, and usage. Obesity is a combination of excess and subsequent adaptation. It is not an acute increase in energy consumption. Over time, excess carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids are stored in adipose depots. The storage of lipids actually induces the proliferation of these adipose tissues. Specific locations of what adipose tissue is being filled, whether it be your subcutaneous or belly fat or your visceral fat, which is around your organs, is a good predictor of insulin resistance. On the left, you see a chart of exactly how increased adiposity affects downstream pathways, eventually leading to negative events such as congestive heart failure, stroke, and chronic kidney disease. You do not need to know everything that is in this chart. It is just an example of exactly what increased adiposity can do. Regulators of insulin signaling. You may be familiar with the insulin receptor. It is a receptor tyrosine kinase that autophosphorylates itself at tyrosine residues. This autophosphorylation then leads to two distinct pathways being activated. The PI3 kinase AKT pathway, which regulates glucose uptake, lipid synthesis, glycogen synthesis, and protein synthesis, as well as the RAS MAPK or MAP kinase pathway, which then regulates cell growth and proliferation. You'll see on the right a demonstration of how these pathways interact with one another. You are not, it is not necessary to know all of the intermediates. However, we will go over the PA3 AKT pathway in the next slide. We will now go over how the insulin signal propagates through the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. Once insulin binds to the insulin receptor, this induces a conformational change in the insulin receptor that leads to the autophosphorylation of the insulin receptor at tyrosine residues. This phosphorylation leads to the recruitment of the insulin receptor substrate one protein, which then becomes phosphorylated. IRS1 then activates PI3 kinase, which catalyzes the addition of a phosphate group to the membrane lipid phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate, or PIP2. This converts it to PIP3, or phosphatidyl inositol 345 bisphosphate, also known as PIP3. P10 acts as a regulatory step in this process and can interconvert PIP2 and PIP3. PIP3 then binds a protein kinase called AKT, which is activated by other protein kinases. AKT then catalyzes the phosphorylation of key proteins, leading to an increase in glycogen synthase activity and recruitment of the glucose transporter GLUT4 to the membrane. Insulin signaling is complex and varied and can go wrong at many different periods. On the left is a representation of some of the ways that insulin signaling is known to go wrong. All of these different inputs lead to the activation of serine threonine kinases. These serine threonine kinases are known to attenuate the insulin response. And this can be done directly by decreasing receptor affinity by phosphorylation of the insulin receptor directly and indirectly through the phosphorylation of downstream mediators by these serine threonine kinases. 
We have learned previously that insulin signals are propagated differently depending on the tissue type. It follows that insulin resistance presents differently in the different insulin sensitive tissues. In muscle, an energy user, insulin resistance presents as a decrease in glucose transport and a decline in muscle glycogen synthesis, despite a increase in circulating insulin. In adipose tissues, the energy storage depot, insulin resistance presents as impaired insulin stimulated glucose transport and an impaired inhibition of lipolysis. In the liver, which we now know does a lot for the body's glucose homeostasis, insulin resistance presents as continuous glyconeogenesis and stimulates fatty acid synthesis. So what are the clinical presentations of insulin resistance? In the short term, you're going to have increased circulating glucose levels, and that leads to an increase in fatigue as cells are no longer able to use glucose as an energy source. Chronic insulin resistance leads to the development of type 2 diabetes. If left untreated, this can lead to severe weight loss and ketoacidosis. Insulin resistance is going to lead to impaired glycolysis and you can, as you can no longer metabolize glucose. This is going to lead the liver to produce ketone bodies. And as a result, blood pH drops dramatically. This leads to confusion and other downstream effects that can result in death. Increased circulating glucose levels like those found during insulin resistance lead to the glycation or the addition of glucose to free amines on proteins. One way that we diagnose insulin resistance is through the measurement of glycated hemoglobin. This might ring a bell more so as HB1AC. As you have an increase in glucose circulating throughout the blood, non-enzymatic addition of glucose to hemoglobin will accumulate over time. This makes this a good ind indicator of ins chronic insulin resistance. Additionally, chronically high levels of circulating glucose lead to the deposition of glucose in tissues that it is not normally. Diabetic cataracts are a visible example of this process, where glucose traverses the lens, is converted into sorbitol, which then induces osmotic damage, leading to opacification of the eye. This concludes our lesson on the regulation of mammalian fuel metabolism. In the next video lesson, we will have a brief overview of nucleotide and DNA structure.